Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Budtown United Methodist Church. Our uh, greeter today was Bobby Lyons. The, uh, apparently I'm the liturgist, whatever that is. <laughs> and uh, our reader today will be Brooke Doyle. The mission jar uh, goes to the U Ukraine trust chain. And um, the November mission jar and drive will benefit the Samos Jewish Family and Children's Services of Southern New Jersey. There's a web address there for you. Please also bring canned goods as well. In addition to the coin jar for Thanksgiving baskets, Brenda would like to give us a little, little more information about that at this time. So the mission jar for November is going to benefit the Samos Jewish Family and Children's Services of South Jersey to show our support for our Jewish brothers and sisters and to show that we stand with Israel. The money collected in the, the jar is going to go to their food bank and the food bank will help the Jewish community there as well as any person that's in need. You do not have to be of the Jewish faith, they help all denominations. And they also asked that if we could collect some canned goods that will be distributed in their food pantry to help them through the Thanksgiving season. So soups, canned vegetables, canned fruit, tuna fish, if you could please bring that in every Sunday when you bring in your $1 for the mission jar. And there's a, a bin in the back that has a little sign on it to please just place the canned goods in there. And then I'll deliver them at the end of the month. And also, they asked if we would be able to make Thanksgiving cards to be included with the food baskets that are delivered to the shut-ins and the elderly. So Danny and Declan have been busy. I just said to him, you would that. He's been busy helping to make them. We started last week, and we're gonna do some more this week, make little Thanksgiving cards. They're such great helpers and such a big help. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brendan. The altar flowers are given to the glory of God. Uh, next Bible study will be announced in the coming weeks. Some dates to remember, November 5th. Don't forget to set your clocks back. Also, uh, Bud 10 has decided to honor Saints Day uh, this year and will be held as part of the service on November the 5th. November the 5th will be the last day to um, uh, honor your loved ones. Now you can see Mary Kay uh, if you have any questions. Excuse me, Alvin. I just need the names by today. Oh, the names? Okay. She needs the names by today. And um, November 10th to the 11th is the yard sale. Sign up to assist in the back. Yeah, um, can I just add to that? There was a, the sign up sheet is now gone, but now I have a sheet there to, if you can make soup or and or baked goods and print out um, what you would be bringing just so we have an idea of, of you know what's coming in so that we don't get all chocolate chip cookies or all brownies so we get a variety you can see what other people are making and please do we need it for both days and if you want to make the soup ahead there's containers over there plastic containers if you need some take them they're <coughs> Pastor Ernie and Erica will be on a well-deserved vacation through November 22nd. Filling the pulpit will be Reverend Jerry Hopkins Doerr on November the 5th, Reverend Alyssa Roosh on November 12th, and Reverend Marv Wills on November 19th. Uh, we do have, um, are we going to sing to anybody today? Well, we have Pat Serbas on the on the first, so I don't. So, but no. Eric is not going to be here. Yeah, that's 
So, so, so it looks like we do have a birthday on the seventh, right? Erica Williams is going to be seven. So I think we should. Start. So um, it seems we have an anniversary. Art and Brenda Allen are celebrating their third anniversary. Number 50. Some kind of record there. You know, when you've been married for 50 years, you develop superpowers. And one of them is reading each other's minds. <laughs> Yes. Go ahead. Our, um, our gathering chorus is Spirit of the Living God, found on page 393 of your hymnal. Please join me in our call to worship. We celebrate the nearness of the living God, whom all time and space cannot contain. We cannot travel beyond the reach of God's love or escape the intensity of God's wrath. God meets our needs as a gentle nurse and silence critics with a word of love. Let us celebrate with joy and gratitude the deliverance God offers in Jesus Christ. Let us lift our voices to declare our faith and renew our commitment to share ourselves with others. Our hymn of praise is found on page 158, Come Christians, Join to Sing.
seated. Our opening prayer. May the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you embrace us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we may rejoice and be glad all day. Teach us to give expression to your love, your beauty, and your creativity in our work, our service, and our play. May others see you and know you through your words and actions. May we be caring witnesses of your vast, mysterious, loving, and creative presence in our world. We confess that we have been greedy and selfish to things of this world. And even with the love you have poured out among us, right around us, the narrow focus of our own immediate self-interest without awareness of people who are used and abused or who are suffering and struggling. Receive us now, O oh God, and bring us to a fuller acceptance of your life-changing forgiveness. Please join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our act of praise is Psalm 90. It's found on page 809 of our hymnal. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. You turn us back to the dust and say, Turn back, O mortal ones. For a thousand years in your sight, a part of us is You sweep them away, they are like a dream, like grass which is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. For we are consumed by your anger, by your wrath we are overwhelmed. You have set out to give For all our days pass away under your wrath. Our years come to an end like a sob. The years of our life are threescore and ten. Or even by reason of strength full score. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and many fly away. Who considers the power of your anger, the awesomeness of your wrath? So teach us to number our days, that we may receive a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands.
morning, everyone. The scripture lesson for today comes from 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 8. You can find us in the New Testament on page 203 of your pew Bible. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and had been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with pretext for greed, nor do we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, that we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you, that we were determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. Okay, the gospel lesson for today comes from Matthew 22, verses 34 to 46. This can be found also in the New Testament of your pew Bible on page 25. Please stand if you wish. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, an expert in law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. God bless you. And a second is like, is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. Now why the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the spirit calls him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I'm amazed sometimes at uh, <clears throat> what the bulletin can say to us. I don't always get a chance to read every word of it beforehand, but I read most of it beforehand. But I, I, I'm, sometimes I'm struck by the things that the bulletin says. And then this week I was particularly uh, struck by a little note that appeared in the bulletin. I knew it was coming, so I'm not entirely surprised. But, <clears throat> but the note said this. Pastor Ernie and Erica will be on a much, on a well-deserved vacation. <laughs> and I was trying to figure out what makes a vacation well-deserved. I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to answer that yet. <clears throat> but by way of clarity, I just want to let you know that yes, Eric and I are again going on vacation. And we'll be away in Spain and Portugal for a few weeks. And uh, we're bound to have a good time. And we'll be in Barcelona when you meet next week. Um, the time difference is such that it's not likely that we'll be able to connect with you live. But don't worry, we'll check up on you just to make sure <clears throat> that no one is entirely out of hand while we're away. And then one further word. <clears throat> well, I, I think one of the things we have to be really careful about is whether or not Carol Ann is standing on pews. I mean, that's something new. <laughs> <laughs> so one other little explanation, just so that you know what's going on. Um, just again by way of being upfront and candid with you. All of you know that I was retired and came out of retirement to be here. As a retired person, one of the things we plan to do is to travel. So all of these things we are doing are things that were planned and reservations in most cases made before I was appointed here. And graciously, the PBR committee has um, acceded to our request to continue our vacation plan. So it may be a little unusual to have a pastor who's on vacation as often as this one is, <laughs> but hopefully it won't last forever, at least from your perspective. Uh, from mine, well, we'll see. Let's take a moment to pray together. <clears throat> As we quiet our hearts and minds before you, O oh God, we do so in the recognition again that every single one of us needs your touch on our lives. So as the music said it before us, so now we verbalize it. And we pray that you would touch us, hearts and minds, inviting us into your fellowship afresh, speaking to us your truth, and allowing us always to know your love, your grace. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our collective hearts be acceptable to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You shall love the Lord <clears throat> with all your heart your soul, and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The commandments pose for us an inescapable dilemma as Christians. On the one hand, <clears throat> they convey to us in relatively unambiguous terms God's intention for our lives. The commandments set out God's expectations of us. On the other hand, 
For all but the incorrigibly presumptuous among us, there is an awareness that we cannot obey all of God's commands. We cannot meet the standards that God has set. We live out our lives in this strange place, the context of knowing but not doing what God requires of us. It's important for us to note that this is the uncomfortable place inhabited by Martin Luther, that great reformer, and of course this being Reformation Sunday, we ought at least to mention his name today. Martin Luther was <clears throat> deeply conscious of God's expectations and his personal failure to live into those expectations. Martin Luther made that marvelous discovery that has become a biblical mantra for Protestantism all around the world for a couple of hundred years now. By grace, you have been saved through faith. Yes, we know it comes from Ephesians chapter 2, but it was Martin Luther who underscored that passage, who put it in bold and made sure that the type was a bold red. Indeed, <clears throat> among the many threads that hold Reformation theology together, there is this affirmation that our salvation depends not on what we have done, but on what God has done. It's a matter of grace. The human dilemma is often cost in terms of, of this dichotomy between law and grace. Oftentimes, they are viewed as a contradiction of each other, but that's not true. Our Judeo-Christian tradition teaches that in its essence, law is simply another form or shape of grace. It was Martin Luther and the other reformers who helped us to move toward a greater appreciation of grace. For Protestants then, grace became that mediating principle which allowed us to live out our faith amid the ambiguity of knowing God's will but not managing to do God's will. It is in the context of our failure to measure up to God's standards that grace is able to carry us through. Or, or in the words of that wonderful hymn we sing so often, "'Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home." In our gospel, <clears throat> Jesus is confronted by a hostile group who are intent on testing him. We need to note the words carefully here. The lawyer's question is not simply about the greatest commandment, but the greatest commandment, quote, in the law. Matthew added those words to point out the nature of the trap. The rabbis had counted 613 commands. 248 of them are what we might term positive commands, and they correspond to the number of body parts. At least that's how they calculated it in those days. And 365 of these commands are negative commands corresponding to the number of days in the year. Now, the intention of the lawyer was to entrap Jesus into saying something that might somehow be construed as antagonistic 
to the law if they succeeded they would have won the answer Jesus gives about loving God and neighbor has become a prominent feature of Christianity and we take it to be almost axiomatic so Jesus takes two pieces from the First Testament or the Old Testament and then stitches these two together. It is unlikely that Jesus was the first one ever to do that. But in joining together Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18, Jesus is simply holding intention that which all Jews knew and understood. That is this double commandment, which is a summary of human obligation. So <clears throat> what is the force of this double commandment in Matthew? A clue can be found in verse 40. On these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets. Now, this is a very powerful and dramatic statement. And with this double commandment, Matthew takes us back to the early part of his gospel, where Jesus begins his teaching ministry with a similarly powerful and dramatic statement. I quote, do not suppose that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Now these two verses <clears throat> bracket the body of teaching that Jesus offers to us in Matthew's gospel. All of it literally 17 chapters of teaching. Remember that Matthew is writing to a primarily Jewish audience. He has a concern to present the teaching of Jesus in such a way that when Jews are able to hear the teaching, they are in the main going to nod their head and say, yes, I understand, I can affirm. The whole thrust of Jesus' teaching has been to correct the manipulative and the oppressive way in which the law was used by the religious leaders of the day. It is in this sense that Jesus talks about fulfilling the law and the prophets. Douglas Hare, <clears throat> one of the common that I particularly enjoy poses <clears throat> for us the central issue of the double commandment with this question. Quote, are these two injunctions set side by side merely to indicate that human responsibility involves two parallel but separate spheres of accountability or or are they interrelated? In this regard, the testimony of the gospel is unambiguous. Love of neighbor will teach us how to love God. <coughs> Jesus demonstrates this in his treatment of the Sabbath law, in which he clearly advocates that loving our neighbor takes precedence over keeping the Sabbath holy. Furthermore, Jesus radicalized neighbor love even further by insisting that we love not only our neighbors, but our enemies. This makes no sense at all except to those who know that God empowers them 
to imitate the Creator's generosity and grace. We might thus conclude that this double commandment is not two separate commandments, but one integrated command. A rabbi asked his disciples how one could tell when the night ends and the day dawns. What's the crossover moment? One replied eagerly, <clears throat> it happens when you see an animal at a distance and you are able to tell whether it is a, a cow or a horse. The rabbi shook his head in disappointment. A second disciple said, <clears throat> day has begun when you can distinguish an oak from a cottonwood tree. Again, the rabbi shook his head. How then, rabbi, would you tell, they asked. He replied simply, day has begun when you look in the face of a stranger and there see a brother or sister. But if you cannot do this, it still remains night. In an age <clears throat> when the word love is greatly abused and devalued, we need to remember that the primary component of biblical love is not some kind of affection. It's commitment. We may have warm feelings of gratitude as we count our different blessings. However, this double commandment does not demand from us warm feelings. Loving demands an intractable and unswerving commitment to both God and neighbor. Loving involves us in imitating God by taking the needs of others seriously, even as God has done with us. Loving our neighbor, our enemies, as we love ourselves is enormously empowering. We forget that. Dr. Julius Segal is a psychologist who conducted studies of American servicemen who, in his words, quote, <clears throat> lived through an incredible nightmare as captives in Vietnam. They found these captives, they found that simple acts of charity toward one another helped to raise their power of endurance. One former POW said, <clears throat> the best thing you could do was to give when you had no hope of getting anything in return. This kind of giving enlarges our spirits, provides us with the capacity to transcend both self and circumstance. And God knows how much we need that today. The good news, the good news for us today is that the one who commands us to love is also the one who empowers us to obey. And there is more good news. When we fail, I promise you we will. When we fail and we find ourselves knowing but not doing 
God's will, there is amazing grace to carry us through. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, Tish is ready, so we are. Our hymn of response, Amazing Grace. <clears throat> okay. Tish was asking if we're singing all the verses. Of course we are. There's <laughs> lots of grace. Eight eighty five. 
885 is the page. Eight eight five, a modern affirmation. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit, as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. <clears throat> Again, invite us, whether we are here gathered together or worshiping in our homes, to remember God's goodness, God's love, God's grace, and to acknowledge that one of the ways, one of many ways in which we respond to God's love and grace is in the service of our giving. So we'll have our ushers today receive our gifts, but invite all of those who are not with us to keep this in mind. Eternal God, we are grateful for your grace. Thank you for opportunities like these when we are able concretely to say thanks to you. We are also mindful of the needs of so many others. We lift them up in the context of our worship, but recognize that there are so many different people in so many places who are in need. Help us never 
to lose sight of them. Keep us always generous by virtue of our faith. As we invite you to receive these gifts and bless them, again we pray that you will use them to sustain the ministry of this congregation, but use them also to bring in your kingdom of peace with justice. We pray in Christ's name. I want to invite us again to <clears throat> be aware of some of the needs within our church family. Um, it's good to see that Don is back with us in his uh, regular position. Um, know that he's been through a time of travail and so grateful that he is able to be here today. And uh, <clears throat> also know that uh, Trish gathers with us, uh, knowing that her, her husband is in hospital. And uh, in the early stages, there was uh, less clarity about what the ailment was. But um, apparently, he is feeling a lot better. Um, I know Trish doesn't want to hear this, but feeling better is not the most important thing in hospital. The most important thing is to get information about what ails him, what is it that caused him to be there in the first place. So our prayer will be for him, yes, that he will feel better, but that he will get the kind of information uh, that will be helpful to him. Thank you. Fred, any news? Same old Fred. <laughs> Same old Fred. We won't tell him exactly what <laughs> she said, but we understand the sentiment. Yes? Kevin is still the same in the hospital. And also yesterday, I was on the way to Columbus Farmer's Market, and there was a very bad accident. A little baby they had laying on the blanket on the ground. So I Yes. Carmel Mercies for you and Erica. Good trip. Can you add good weather to that? <laughs> <laughs> Someone else was. Just had the safe trip. Thank you. Yes. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come before you, we are ever grateful for your word and how it provides us with information about your expectations of us, conveyed so clearly in the commandments you have provided. Yet at the same time, we acknowledge too that few of us imagine that we can always do what you want us to do or be what you want us to be. So, so we are grateful for the way in which you provide for us, as it were, a safety net of grace. So that when, when we do mess up, you never leave us alone or forsaken, but you come to be alongside of us. And we are grateful for those moments 
And we are grateful for those times when having messed up, we have the wisdom to open our hearts to your presence so that we can again stand tall as those forgiven and continue the work you call us to do. And we pray too that as you have accepted us despite our failures, despite who we are, you keep working on us and in us so that we will do the same to others. Today we hold before you those persons whose names have been lifted up, those situations that cause us alarm and anxiety. So we pray for Don and Joe and Fred, Kim, for a baby on the side of the road during an accident, for a situation at school where sometimes the struggles that teachers as well as students go through are often disguised. And we pray that you will provide travel mercies for those who are blessed enough to be able to travel. But we commend all of these situations into your love and care. But of course, we want to pray also for an aching world for there is violence and war and suffering. That is true in many different places, but what touches our hearts so much more is the ugly violence that takes place in the land of your birth. So we ask you to, first of all, be with everyone there who suffers. There have been more deaths than we are able to count at this time. There are families bereft. There are people who want desperately to mourn the loss of loved ones. But for many of those, even that is not possible. So be with people on both sides of the ideological spectrum. For we know that when people are suffering, all of those who suffer are your favorites. And we pray that the international community will find ways in which it can exert and exercise influence in ways that will minimize war and lead us on the road toward peace. Mm. And then pray again for each one of us that you will help us as we leave this place to do so, knowing that we are grace-filled people and asking that within our hearts we will know the peace of Christ which passes all understanding. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn, number 408, <clears throat> 408, The Gift of Love.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sharing of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.